My name is Peter Tice and I'm the Executive Director here at Studio Channel Island and I'd like to thank you all for joining us um, this afternoon uh, via Zoom. It's great to see so many people, um, some I know, some I don't know, um, and it, it's just lovely to have you with us. Uh, we're all looking forward to getting back into the gallery, but between, um, between now and then we're, we're going to try to continue to connect with, with you through um, any means that we can. Um, so our, our five panel members are um, in no particular order, uh, Francis Elson, uh, Peggy Pownell, Sandra Klein, Dougie Wallace, and Catherine Chan Lu. So I'm gonna ask each of those artists to, uh, to introduce themselves. And um, I have three kind of questions that I'd like each of them to answer as to introduce themselves. That is, what is their name and art form? What was the, uh, the last exhibition that they were in before this one? And um, what is the subject of their work in the, in the current exhibition? So if I will start with, uh, with Fran, if Fran, you could uh, take the floor and introduce yourself. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Fran Elson, and uh, my art form is fused glass. And it was because of that art form that I created this exhibition. The exhibition is called Broken and it deals with my Holocaust history. And so the last uh, exhibition I had of this work, because this has kind of taken over my life in the last couple of years, the last exhibition I had of the entire work was at uh, Temple Beth Torah in Ventura, uh, when it was previewed as the opening to the Jewish Film Festival. And, um, so it was there for a month and it led to all kinds of other exhibitions on this um and as i said that has really um taken over most of my time in the last few years um the subject of my work is um, my story and my family's story um uh, in the holocaust and specifically dealing with survival uh, more than the, the, I would call the usual Holocaust story. It doesn't deal so much with concentration camps. It deals more with displaced persons camps and surviving and finding a new place to live. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be here and share this with you today. Thank you, Fran. Um, Peggy, if I could ask you to introduce yourself. Um, I'm Peggy Pownell. <laughs> um, my, uh, I'm, my work is mixed media. Um, I think of myself as a painter, but I used to use a lot of mixed media elements. Um, the last show that I had was in January at Vita Art Center in Ventura. And uh, the work that I have in this show has, I have not shown any of it before. This is the first time that I've shown this work. It is, um, about my grieving process uh, after losing my husband very suddenly about three and a half years ago. And um, I, I started creating the work that I'm showing that, uh, that is specifically about the, the grief, but also about hope and uh, finding my way through this. The title of my portion of the show is um, The Hold Hands, Take a Breath. Thank you, Peggy. Um, Catherine, can I ask you to introduce yourself, please? Um, <clears throat> I'm a mixed media artist, and um, um, the previous show I was showing at the Orange County Center for Contemporary Art. And that body of work actually was my more political work more more recent political work it's not this body of work the, uh, my sister and i took care of our parents el elderly parents for 10 years intensively and my parents live in santa monica and they live independently and they love santa monica so I live in Thousand Oaks. So I have to day, do the daily drive to take care of them when it's my turn. And um, by the time I got home, I usually don't have energy to work. 
So I had to set up a system so that I will work. So I, I figured I had been with them nearly all 24 hours of the day uh, watching them. So I, I will call it the color of the light uh, wherever the, my studio is. Um, I have a small um, portable unit uh, that I can carry it wherever I I go. And um, I figured we with each hour, I would do two pieces of work and that will make 48 pieces. And that, you know, that will keep me working. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Sandra, could I ask you to introduce yourself, please? I'm Sandra Klein, and I'm a visual artist, but in this series and for some time now, I've been using photography um, as my main uh, art form. Uh, the last show I was in was actually in Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, a show called Beyond the Surface, the photograph as um, object. And this series for me is a meditation on the grief that I feel over the loss of my son, um, tragically, about three years ago. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I finally, could I ask um, Dougie to introduce herself, please? Uh, hi, my name is Dougie Wallace, and I normally work in pastels. I uh, usually do uh, contemporary realism a lot of portraiture. I do a lot of commission portraits. The last show, I actually had spent six months in Berlin um, right before this. Uh, I came home right as the travel restrictions started taking effect, so I kind of sped up my return a little bit <laughs> to be sure that I can get home. Um, so I was actually in an exhibit in Berlin uh, during that stay, and I was scheduled to be in an exhibition in Chicago in the spring and that was canceled due to the pandemic and it ended up just being an online exhibit and that was with another portrait. Um, the current work is a combination. It's nine of the victims of the borderline mass shooting uh, that I did portraits for the families for and I borrowed the portraits back and I wanted to expand a little bit on that um, and what happened in Thousand Oaks right after the the mass shooting back in November two, uh, 2018 was that the, um, the Woolsey fire broke out within 24 hours of that. It was just a horrible week in our community. So I wanted to reference that a lot of the families that had dealt with the, with the shooting also were dealing them with evacuations and it was just a horrendous week in our community. So, so my, my work, pertains to both of those. And the work that references the fire is completely different from the, the realistic portraits. Um, it's quite a departure for me. It's very abstract work. Um, I was actually inspired by a new material that I found during my stay in Berlin, that's stone paper, and that's what I create, used to create those, those pieces to reference the fires. And I named the exhibit, or my part of it, Fire and Ice based on a Robert Frost poem that basically refers to two ways of destructions that humans um, tend to do to each other. And there's different ways you can interpret the fire and the ice, but the ice refers to hatred uh, and indifference, which also ties into what I see currently happening. Thank you, Dougie. And, um, and thank you, panel, for, for introducing yourselves. So I'll, I'll move into the first of the three questions that I'd like us to, um, to talk about quite um, broadly. Um, the first question is, um, starts with a statement. Um, exhibitions about death and how we respond to loss are still fairly rare. Do you think as artists that death is still a taboo subject in our community? And did you worry about how this exhibition was going to be seen when it was opened? I, I, I think I was worried when we had it scheduled for, I think what the original date was in April, I think. And we were in the midst of 
the pandemic. And I think we all kind of felt, even if we had been allowed to be open, that that might not be the right time um, mm -hmm. to add more. I, I, I don't know, I don't know how, how to word it, but I think we were worried that, um, you know, it wasn't the time to, to reminisce about past tragedies when we were dealing with current ones. So that was my concern a little bit. I mean, we're going through so much already. Did I want to bring back the memories of, of you know, two years or a year and a half ago, of what we went through then? Um, I felt better about it now when opening later, uh, I think. And from what I've seen from the visitors, I think people are actually really um, finding comfort in, in the exhibit and it resonates with them. Um, and the fact that we can't allow too many people in at one time, we didn't have a big reception for it. I think it creates this atmosphere of quiet contemplation that I think is actually um, a, a really positive thing that came out of this. And people can come in and just sit with it, quietly contemplate it. Um, yeah, so I think it's actually turned into a positive thing where before I was a little afraid that it would just be adding too much to people. I, I agree right with I agree with you, Daggy, on that. I was very nervous actually about doing the show in the original way that we were going to do it for the same reason that I felt it was not a time it was a time when people were facing so many tragedies of their own that it didn't seem like a time to be talking about any specific one. But I think that as time went by and Peter's idea of changing the focus of it to be more about survival and about how we deal with the tragedies and the loss, I think that made it um, much more important to do, to actually do now um, than to leave for another time. So, so I'm really happy with presenting it in this way because basically when I do my presentation, it's seen more as talking about tragedy. And I think we can talk about survival. I, um, I never felt any worry about showing this work. Um, I did want to make two distinct uh, comments. One is that I think that talking about death and looking at death um, is a taboo in this country. Um, especially compared to some other cultures. I've lived in Mexico where the Day of the Dead um, is a joyous celebration, the return of the souls. And um, for years and years, people have been creating art um, about death there, especially um, printmakers like Posada. Um, I think the other thing is that a nonprofit like, like um, this, um, place allows us to have this kind of a show. I know that um, I once had a review with a gallery director who's, who liked my work but said she didn't feel like it would sell because the theme was about our, uh, was about death. So, um, I th and, you know, I appreciate and thank you, Peter, so much for being willing to um, allow us to make art, to, to um, show uh, art about this theme, which is, Part of life, death. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, Sandra. I think that in, in our Western society, we've placed death in, um, in hospitals and in professional settings, and it's quite rare for um, somebody to come across um, an experience of death that isn't related to um, a close family member. And that is a very different experience of death to um, you know, a, a loss that is more distant from you. And I think that. Um, creates a, a very heightened response to death, um, which it, it, one filled it with fear in a way which I, I think is very unhealthy. Um, but I'm not part of this panel, so I will pass on to, um, to Peggy or Catherine. Would you like to join in? Well, I would just say that, um, that it, it has been, it is difficult for us to talk about death, and uh, which is odd because it is the most universal experience that we will all have and we all deal with loss. And so it's, it is very odd, but we so want to believe that things can be how we want them to be. And so we 
we're in denial about a, a lot of these things. I do also really appreciate the opportunity to, to show this body of work in this setting um, where it's not about sales and, um, and, and putting work out there that is going to be appealing to everyone. But I, I feel like what we've created in this exhibit um, really is speaking to the people that, that go and, and see it in person because we've kind of poured a lot of our heart and soul into each body of work. And I, I just feel like that comes through and that there's not only the message of uh, what it's like to be in the grieving process, but I, but I feel real hope when you walk into that um, gallery and you see work that is so personal and yet so universal and, um, and you know we're, we're telling our very very private um, stories but they they apply to everyone really and I'm I'm thrilled that we can, can have the opportunity to to share that yeah I, I also think grief have very different types of griefs. To grieve an elderly parent, it's entirely different from a sudden loss of a son, right? So I think this, um, I think Peter put this, uh, this show together, uh, compass all a various degree of grief. And I think that is um, nice to see. I'll move on to my second question, um, and it kind of it picks up on on what Catherine was was just mentioning about different types of uh, types of grief. Um, each of you, as artists, has been on a, a highly personal journey to deal with a very specific tragedy um, within your own life. But when you look at each other's work, and um, do you see common threads with your own experience? Do you see uh, a harmony with your own creativity and, and the work of others in the show? I think I see different personalities, a more direct portrait. And some artists choose uh, a kind of a poetry, you know, a poetic um, expression. I think we, I see personalities and individuality, which is nice. Thank you, Catherine. I see. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, hon. Uh, no, I was just gonna. I, I really appreciate that, Catherine. I um, I agree. I got to see the show yesterday, and it's 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 a really beautiful show. Um, it is very meditative and poetic. Although, again, as as Catherine said, there's realism, and then there is Catherine's abstract images, and I think. In between, there's a gamut of kinds of, of artwork, and um, I, you know, each of us has a different perspective. But I think all of the work clearly is about grief, but clearly presents um, a joy also. And um, I think that's what we all mean to do as artists. And I, I think the other point I wanted to make was that um, the making of the art. The actual making of it um, is a place where for me and I think many of the other artists although I, I don't need to speak for them it's a place of respite um, the actual making the physical making um, is a meditative um, experience that I think artists in general feel and um, it alleviates a lot of the grief and pain that um, is felt For me, because I I did the um, the realistic portraits, and so to begin with, they were never meant to be shown in an exhibition. It was something that happened in my neighborhood. Uh, I did not know any of the victims personally. I did know some of the survivors. Um, my daughter did know some of the victims. She used to uh, go to Borderline uh, to dance and. Oh, wow. As it was happening, she actually called me that night um, 
I didn't know what was going on. I was already in bed and she uh, called me and said, mom, I'm okay, I'm not there. Uh, so I kind of went through it live with her on the phone as she's trying to text her friends that she knew were there that night. And um, so it hit really, really close to home for me. Um, and what I've learned before, I've done posthumous portraits before. And it, it was always surprising to me of how much they touched families more so than just looking at a photograph of, of the, their loved one. There's something about the act of painting uh, that touched them a lot more for some reason. Um, even though these were basically paintings done from photos that they gave me, but they, they somehow resonate with them more. Um, so for me, the only thing I could give back, you know, there were all these fundraisers, I didn't have any money to give, but I thought, well, I can give this, I can create a portrait. And it was also in a selfish way for me, a way to feel close to the victims. That might sound a little strange, but um, I, I had this deep need to connect. And in a weird way, Peggy, seeing your work, and the very tactile, you know, quality of it, the fact that you spend hours and hours and hours touching your husband's clothes and to create something new out of it. And all those stitches, I mean, those, gosh, millions of stitches you have in that work, for me, went because I work in pastel and it's a very tactile, tactile medium, you know, there's nothing between me and the painting. It's just me and a pastel stick, pure pigment. Um, as I was working on the portraits, you know, I do a little bit of blending on them. So I almost felt like I was, like they were there with me, which might be something that maybe you had felt when you were working on, on, on your work. Even though I didn't know them, there was a profound connection that I felt with them. And when I'm blending their faces and I'm working on all the details of their faces, trying to get the likeness just right, there's just, I just felt like I was touching them. So when I saw your work, that's what probably resonated most with me where I, I got that. You know, I, I understood I was sitting there spending hours with that as a meditation and then feeling connected to the person that was lost. Yeah, it's very, very interesting, the thoughts that just go through your mind when you're doing that, when you are touching something that is, um, you know, like in your case, you, you are so hands-on with the pastels and, you, and it's their faces that you're, that you're touching. And um, there's, there's something that, you know, just in the process of doing it and the time that it takes to to create these things it's just all these things just kind of run through your mind that are connections um with this show i definitely found um a connecting thread between the artists even though each story was you know a different uh, a different kind of grief a different manifestation of it i think i think we were so so linked in a way. One of the things that has been um, kind of startling to me actually in my grieving process is that I have found that when I have been sobbing about uh, losing Tim, I have had this very strong sense that I was crying not only for my own loss, but for for the deep sorrows of collective humanity, you know, it just, you, when you have this experience, it just kind of put, puts you in this alternate state where you are feeling something that's way beyond yourself, really. And, and it's this connection to, to all the loss in the world. And I think that when we, when we share that visually with other people, um, it just, I, I think there's something that, that comes through and, and can, can speak to, um, to our common humanity and to um, this thing that we all share really more than anything else because we're not going to go through this life and not have loss and not have to um, 
to do some kind of grieving process. And uh, so I think it's very connecting in that way. I, I think that one of the things that, that uh, really struck me when I was hanging the show and seeing the rest of the show was that my, my particular story that I'm telling doesn't have, I can't put a date on it. I can't say this is the day that, that someone dear to me died and life changed or a, a specific day that a tragedy happened and life changed. Because when I started to tell this story, I didn't know anything almost about it. So it was discovering the story. It was, I knew this was in my past, but because my parents never spoke of it, I didn't really have a story to tell. And when I, when I realized that I did have a story to tell and I had a way to tell it, which was through the glass, I actually started by making one piece. And what I went through when I made that was, the sort of synthesis of the grief for one person that was I started with my dad and then realized I am going to tell this story about all of my family and so each piece kind of grew out of that so um it's kind of it's kind of a different way because the tragedy and the grief that I feel is for half of my family um you know I have no family on one side of, of of my family and so it's not it's not specific to only one person it is more of a a grief for things that have been going on for many 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 centuries and culminated with the um the holocaust and are and for me especially now and for me those things are repeating themselves again in our country so that grief is going on that grief that i feel for the loss of so many of my relatives i makes me very fearful today because i see that continuing i don't see a change to that and um so that's a little uh, it's a little different, I think, from the other um, parts of this show, but it makes me really very pleased to be in the show because I think we can turn that to a more positive uh, way of looking at things. And what I, what I think that I did creating this process is started out with the grief, but as you said, Sandra, I think, it ends up more with the hope that rather than focusing on only all of those people that are gone, I can focus on the people that are here from my family and what the legacy of the parents are because of the children and the grandchildren and the great grandchildren. So there's that movement from the grief to the hope. Um, I just wanted to make one quick comment about Francis, what you said, but um, also what Peggy said, for me, um, and I don't know if you all feel the same way, but grief is probably the most solitary feeling I've ever experienced. And my art is an attempt to really reach people. And obviously nobody's gonna feel that same thing, but to really reach out to humanity um, and create a link. And I, I'm thinking that maybe all of us do that or attempt it. <laughs> well, yeah, but the reaching out as it happened for me too, as I was working on the portraits, because, you know, like I said, I didn't know the victims and I didn't know their families. But as a mom who very easily could have lost my own daughter that night, I, I wanted to reach out to the grieving families and it was almost like I didn't know them. So yes, I attended, you know, one of the services and, or, you know, the memorials and, but I wanted to almost more intimately sit with them and share that grief with them as a mother. And this allowed me to do that without actually doing it. I did it in my own way because yeah, it would have been awkward to just go up to a stranger and, you know, 
Um, so it's interesting that you said that because yeah, it's, it's a reaching out. It's a, it was a strong need to connect yeah. and let them know somehow in a very, you know, ethereal way that I'm sharing their, their grief differently, but I'm, I'm there and I wanted to be there with them. So that takes us on to, um, on to the third question, which, um, connects back to what you've been talking about in terms of the the way that our our community is um, is currently dealing with um, not only the virus and the, the very real prospect that we that we will uh, continue to lose many many people and but also the the current protests that are going on um, around um, around police killings and the very real violence which exists beneath the surface in our in our society and with those two heightened um, focuses upon um, the, the frailty of life. Do you think that our, um, that our audience will see the exhibition um, uh, in a more amplified, more, more deep manner in the current climate than um, you know, if we, we were in a, a more settled period of time? Well, I hope they will. I mean, I hope that they'll make the connections be between seeing these pieces and, and seeing what uh, institutionalized racism leads to in, in my specific work, but I think they need to see what people experience as loss and, and share that somehow. But, but specifically, if what's going on today um, makes people more aware of of where things can lead to without our knowing, how things change slowly in society and then end up being huge disasters. And I think that what we're seeing today with, with institutionalized racism and um, you know, with children in, uh, children in cages and um, it's hard for me to, <laughs> to continue to speak about it, but I hope that they, I hope that people do start to make connections. Now I know that I've given, um, I've presented this body of work in all kinds of institutions over the last couple of years in churches and synagogues and museums and, and place in old folks homes. And, and I have felt a connection with people and I have felt people think or, or understand that this is happening. We have to be careful uh, not to end up in the same place that my family ended up in, in 1940. It's happening in this country and we've got to be so aware of it and do everything we can to turn the tide. Um, thank you, Fran. Um, yeah. I, I know it's, it's painful for you to, um, to talk about this. Um, so, um, would anybody else in the panel like to join in how we um, how we, we think the audience might be um, more sensitive to this exhibition? Um, you know, I've thought about this question since you sent it to us in advance for a long time, and I, I, I personally feel um, I cannot speak to the horrible experiences of police brutality that have been going on for centuries in this country. Um, yet, having lost my son from um, an external cause, I, I, um, I totally, uh, I, I do identify in a certain way with the mothers who have lost these children. And um, in a personal way, on a one-to-one -one level, I, I definitely feel that my work might impact someone. And yet again, I feel, um, I can feel at times that my work is almost trite compared to the tragedy that these people are going through. So I have a very, very mixed feelings about it. I don't think any grief is trite. I think it's just different, yeah. but certainly not, not trite. What gave me uh, a little pause for thought is, is the fact that it took a pandemic to reduce the number of mass shootings in this country. I think I read somewhere back in March was the only March in several years where there wasn't 
the school shooting or, or something like that. Don't quote me exactly on that. But when I read that, I was just so shocked. Um, yeah, that, that to me, that just should make us think that it took a pandemic to reduce the number of mass shootings. Uh, when I read in the newspaper that lots of the seniors in, uh, when you go to the hospital, you are separated from your family and the family actually cannot be on your best side when you're dying. And that made me think of um, all these elders I'm sad about them. I, I think that is a connection of my work to those situations. So. It's beautiful, Catherine. Thank you for saying that because it's so true. <laughs> what struck me is in the early in this conversation, um, Many of you are referring to um, the, the connection between uh, uh, grief and generosity, about feeling a sense of wishing to support others, um, and that empathy is a, a part of grief. And I think that um, as a, a community is invited to um, uh, connect because of the universal nature of a pandemic, that um, we are all um, seeing uh, our community having to deal with um, with loss, um, that it creates a, an empathy and a, and a connection, which um, I, I think the exhibition is um, uh, is helping people to connect with. Um, but um, I'll, I'll move on to the the specific questions for individual. Um, individual artists. And so um, the first uh, first question is for you, Peggy. Um, this this whole exhibition was your idea. I, I don't know if many people know that. Um, the um, uh, Peggy's idea was to bring um, an exhibition on this subject together. Um, I could, I would just like to ask you if, um, if you could say what it was that that you were hoping to achieve when uh, when you brought all of these different um, artists together? Well, I, I know how the process of creating can be healing. And, um, and so I, I hoped that the process of viewing work by artists who were using it to help them heal um, would speak to the, an audience as well. And I, I, felt, I felt like if this could, could come through in the work, with, like I, I knew it would, um, that, that it would, could be helpful to other people who were dealing with loss and um, just the human condition, I think. And when we, when we started this, of course, we didn't know about what was going to transpire in in the whole world, uh, you know, just in an in an instant, it seemed like uh, we had no idea that what was what was coming with the pandemic and so much more. And um, so I was, you know, kind of starting from a different place than where we're at now. But I think that um, that that's what I was was thinking that um, that. It, it could speak to other people who were were experiencing some of the same things or would experience some of the same things that these artists are have um, have dealt with and that we could we could we could do something with that and and on a personal level um, I was doing work that was that was dealing with this. Um, this is what I, how I was working through things. And um, I, I love having the opportunity to, to do a show. And, uh, and for one thing, it's kind of a, a motivating goal. And I, I needed that. <laughs> and, um, and I, you know, I, I was familiar with the work of the other artists that were, um, that were 
dealing with other aspects of this, and I, I knew that, um, that it would be a beautiful show together. I, you, you said something um, just now which um, hadn't occurred to me, which was that making work for an exhibition, having that goal um, to achieve um, required you know, uh, forward momentum having to complete one task after the next task and as a way to create a sense of movement away from the, the, the oppressive static nature of grief. So I was just wondering, um, and I think you touched on it earlier about creativity being a relief. Um, if you could just talk to us a little bit about um, what it felt like on an emotional level to, to complete these works. Yeah, the, the idea of moving forward and just, you know, keep going towards the light. <laughs> don't let, don't fall into that, that big dark abyss. Um, keep moving forward, have, have something in motion that is, that is going towards the positive. That's just been so important to me. And it, it's, um, it's really what kind of motivated um, me to end up with this body of work. Um, at first I was, you know, I mean, I was, I was just in this alternate state and I, I tried painting. I found it very difficult to go to my studio. I found it very difficult to, to paint, even though I made myself do it. But I also had a lot of um, time that I was just sitting, uh, you know, sitting and watching television, just, just numb and or just you know just sitting there in my chair looking out the window and i i you know so i started um creating these objects out of tim's clothing because um i i would open his closet door which i could hardly do and see his clothes and i just um you know i would just close the door again and then i i started um i knew i couldn't just get rid of things i started using them in my work and started creating these orbs, first of all, that um, that are composed out of strips of his shirts that are, um, I, I made these the, the ball part out of um, uh, old sewing patterns that I've wrenched all together and created these orbs and then wrapped in these um, strips of his shirts and then stitched and stitched and stitched. So there's all these um, like someone said, a million stitches <laughs> um, in all these, these orbs. And um, there's something about setting in motion this repetitive process um, where it's, you know, you can just do it without thinking, but, you, but all these thoughts are going through your mind. And then every little stitch is a, a decision, um, even though it's, you know, do I go this way or do I go this way with this stitch? And... Um, and I've got, got some right here. <laughs> so it's like, you know, do I, do I go here? Do I go here? And then I finish it and I set it down and it has really no purpose except it helped me to process and to meditate. And I didn't even realize when I first started making these that this was my art that I was doing. Um, I just thought I was making these things to help, to help me through this. And then pretty soon I had, you know, I had so many, they were rolling all over the place. <laughs> so I created vessels out of Tim's pants to hold the orbs. And then I, I started doing things with his ties and with his jackets. And it became a very, um, a very important process for just getting through the grief, just moving forward, just, um, just trying to, um, trying to go towards the hope, and um, not that the, not that I can't plummet in a minute, <laughs> but, um, but you know that you have no choice but to to keep moving forward, and then having a, a show to look forward to, which I always love. Not every artist loves that. I you know have friends who, who just get so stressed out by shows they don't really enjoy it, but I love putting it together conceptually and, and um, figuring out which, which pieces work together and how they correlate and doing a body of work that, that is cohesive in terms of 
what you're what you're saying, what your theme is about, what you're working with. Um, I love doing that, so I was I was very happy to have a a place for this to to go, and um, and in my my work, it's um, it's surprisingly colorful and bright and hopeful looking. I think even though it's about grief, and I. You know, when I look at it all up there, I think that says something about me, and it's and I I like that that it's that it's you know I, I, I'm um, on, hopefully on a, a hopeful path. One of my titles for when, for well for the these orbs um, is um, heartbroken hope, and I just think there's that part of me where you're it's just you know I'm heartbroken. What? what are you hopeful to? Well, thank you, Peggy. I, I, I greatly admire the, um, the strength that you've taken in, in putting together your work and also the strength that you have to, to be able to express it. Um, so um, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, uh, I'm also struck by the, um, the vibrancy of, of your work, but also the vibrancy in, in all of the work in this show. There was a, a very real risk that in a show about grief, we would have a lot of darkness within the within the artwork that was created. But but all of you have um, have been judicious in your use of color and um, its counterpoint, um, and that kind of leads us on to, onto Catherine and and your work, which which for me um, is a very cerebral response to um, to grief. Um, you know. Uh, light having a, a weight to it, a quality to it, um, and trying to, uh, to take time and light and place those onto, a, onto an artwork. I just wonder if you could just talk to us about how you went about constructing these pieces. I, <clears throat> I think at that time I ordered 20 panels, each of them 15 by 15. I know that I can carry it. And my parents were so in and out of the hospital at that point, the nurse actually had a drawer for me to keep my our supply in. And I usually take the night shift because I can stay awake at night. And so I would I will watch my dad, mostly my dad, and work. work. Uh, I have a um, sort of a standing uh, simple lamp um, by, by my side. I just uh, sit there and work. And I think it calms me. It made me not nervous, made me not watch the ticker thing of the blood pressure, the oxygen level, you know, it, it calms me somewhat. And um, I think it also, it suit my personality. I think, I think all of us are like this. You know, you can do many things well, but if you have not made any art or you have not step in your, spend time in your studio, you are annoyed um, with yourself. And then, you know, and during that time, it is difficult. And yet I was annoyed by myself. So I, I had to put together a simple, you know, I think about what color might be, what hour. Um, I was, impressed by a Japanese haiku that was written like in the 15th century that said, um, I don't remember the rest of the sentences, but he was talking about daybreak. And he says, screen turning silver. I look out the window, screen turning silver. And I know that is um, seven o'clock to me. 
you know. Um, that because I was staying in my uh, dad's bedroom or hospital room, and that, you know, that the, the first light, it actually did look kind of, uh, the air in the room looked kind of silver. So that was the first piece I did. And then I just kind of imagine what color could, could, could be what, what hour. I do know that seven o'clock in the hospital is a visiting hour and you can hear children running in the hallway. And so I chose that set to be the most joyful set, the 7, 7 p.m. Thank you, Catherine. Um, it's, um, it, it's just lovely um, to see your work um, next, to, um, next to Peggy's work, because both of them have a sense of of time and motion and um you know the orbs that that peggy's made um have that um you know the, the, the reminiscent of, of of rotation and and time and, and that movement through the through the hours and then your work is that kind of those punctuated points um the very sort of static experience of time where you're pinioned by an experience um and time seems to stop moving so it, those two, for me, in, in the show, um, they work beautifully next to one another. And um, one of those uh, happy coincidences when you're hanging a show is to find work which just um, speaks to, to one another in that way. Um, moving on to, on to Dougie, um, your portraits were, were a gift to the families. Um, most of your clients, are um, they come to you um, for a portrait, um, and, and, it, and it's a happy uh, experience to have the, the, the portrait. And, and this was a, the, the counterpoint to that, and uh, a very different experience, both for you and for your um, and for the person that you were uh, gifting the work to. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how they responded when they saw the finished piece, when they saw their loved one created into something so beautifully rendered. How did that exchange go? Well, first, I'd, I'd like to explain how it even started because um, I didn't want to just uh, reach out to the families myself. Um, and I didn't want to just take it upon myself to just paint. There were 12 victims in all, and I didn't want to just take it upon myself to just paint them from images that I had seen on the news or in the newspapers. And so I reached out to... Um, the Ventura County um, Victims Advocates Group and let them know that I was offering uh, the portraits as gifts to the families if they wanted them. So they could contact me. Um, and so they sent it out to the families and it, they didn't contact me right away. Um, I think you know, a couple of it did, but not all of them. Um, and that, that's that's okay. There's still I'm, there are nine portraits in this exhibit. Um, there may be uh, one or two more that I will still complete for the families. I told them there's really no expiration date on that, and I know one family um, probably will not reach out, and that's perfectly okay. I wanted to respect their wishes and not intrude um, in any shape or form by just painting the images. And I wanted the families to choose the images. Um, so that could have, you know, if they wanted me to pray, portray their son or daughter when they were five years old, that would have been okay too. It was completely up to them uh, to choose the, the photos. So uh, it made it a challenge because I, you know, I didn't know them. I had not met them. It's always easier to paint a portrait when you meet the people. Um, and also working from photos that, you know, were sometimes more snapshots or, um, so it, it was a challenge that way, but uh, surprisingly, even though me, I as an artist, that's not my ideal working condition, to work from, you know, older photos uh, that were not of the best quality maybe, um, and not having met the people. 
that's always a challenge. And I, so I always have self-doubt whether I'm really getting the likeness right, if I'm capturing the subject. Um, the way the families responded, let me know that I did. Uh, and I find that just fascinating because like I said before, you know, they're giving me the photos, but there's something about the actual painting that resonates more with them than the image it was created from. Um, you know, there's a lot of tears <laughs> that, that happen. Um, one of the things that was a gift to me was getting to know the families. Um, some brought in lots of photos. Uh, so I got to, you know, the, know their, their loved one a little bit through many, many photos, through the stories that they were telling. Um, it, it was a really um, profound exchange for me. And then seeing their reaction when I was always being a, a harsh critic on, on my own work and thinking, oh, I don't know if I, if I got it right. And, and some, I feel like I, I got the personality and the, and the likeness better than with others. Um, but yeah, the, the response has just been amazing. Seeing them in the group setting uh, before the families, you know, I would meet with them individually and then uh, give them their portrait. And they had not seen them all together like that. And I think that is actually, I, I can't totally speak for them, but um, there has been a, um, some really amazing responses. The families still get together, um, most of them. So they do know each other. They're still in contact with each other. And of course, they've been to each other's services and so forth. So, um, and they've seen, you know, uh, memorials and pictures of their loved ones all in a group setting, but they hadn't seen these portraits in a group setting like that. And I think it was, um, I think it really resonated with them. And that was really important in the way Peter arranged the show. Um, with them in a kind of a tight space and cross from each other. So there's that sense of that group setting. And um, I think you said something about that, that that was, uh, right, Peter? That you guys did that on purpose to have them all very close together. Um, and it was a good decision. So thank you. Thank you for that. We, um, we talked about I, that. In the, in well, the one more thing real quick. I do know that some family, from what I've heard from some of the families, that they may not come in and view it because it is too hard to see it all together like that. So, yeah, we, um, we had a long conversation um, about how to um, respectfully show these, these portraits and how to create um, uh, an experience of them. And um, what we, we wanted to do was to create a, a little enclosed space in the center of the gallery where um, you could stand amongst them and, um, and, and see, because you've captured them all as, uh, as joyful people. Each of the portraits, they are um, full of life. And when you see them in that setting, it, it's, they become a group in a way which you wouldn't get if we um, spaced them out along the wall. And had them all just facing into nothing um, but it is very powerful to stand in amongst them and, and, and to be at the same height as though you're, you're meeting with uh, these people who are still amongst us so yeah it, it, it was a, a deliberate act but it was also um, you know <laughs> it is quite difficult to stand there um, when you, you know what, what what you're surrounded by right um, thank you Thank you. And, and I'm grateful. I want to say I'm really grateful for the family's gift and you know lending them back. Yes. So. so. Yeah. Um, Sandra, um, we move on, on on to you. Um, your work um, beautifully illustrates the the alien nature of grief as as a, a bewildering other place, as a um, as a separate place to the one that we are familiar with. Um, you've incorporated uh, Japanese cultural references that will be obscure to, to many people, uh, to me, amongst those many people. Um, can you talk to us about how you selected those references 
and how you think uh, non-Japanese audiences will respond um, to people compared with you know, people who are familiar with, with the references? Um, of course. Um, there are two different kinds of images in my show here. There are in-camera images of um, scenes, landscapes, snowy landscapes in Japan, but there are also composites um, that include historical objects that I took pictures of um, in Japanese museums. And um, although the, um, these objects have specific um, references in Japan, I see them as universal objects also. Um, so I would say the main two objects are the no masks, N-O-H masks. Um, ma a mask is a universal um, object um, used to hide the face for various different, for various reasons. Um, in this, in these images, I see it as a way for me to hide my grief and appear to be um, um, going on in life as if nothing happened. Um, but the other image is the urn and the urn has such a strong meaning for me in so many ways. Um, of course, universally, the urn has um, a meaning of being a vessel of grief. And I think, Peter, you used that term when you were talking to me. I hadn't thought of it in exactly that way. But, um, you know, people in many, many cultures um, keep their ashes in an urn, in a funeral urn. And um, a place, it's a place where people um, hold on to their family member that they've lost. Um, but I also see the urn um, as symbolizing other things. Um, Historically, it's also in many ways um, used to symbolize, symbolize the um, female body. So it's almost a self-portrait also of myself holding on to my son. And I guess the third way I see the urn is um, when I think of the tea ceremony or a coffee ceremony, that the urn is a welcoming. It's, um, it's an object of beauty that um, welcomes people and gives offerings. And so I loved using, um, all those, although these specific urns are Japanese, um, I've, used, I've used other kinds of urns in past series and, and I, I um, just find it a wonderful metaphor, found it a wonderful metaphor to use in this series. Thank you, um, Sandra. Um, Fran, um, your, your work is inspired by the most um, distant of events um, and your work fights against um, the loss of memory, it, um, the need to cherish individuals not as, as one amongst millions who suffered a, a similar fate but as, as human beings, as individuals, each one um, filled with creativity, energy, passions, um, loves, hopes. You know, your, your work locates um, people that you are connected to within um, an event which is so easy to reduce just to numbers and to ideas. Um, in the making of it, did, I think you mentioned earlier that, that you knew very little about some of these people and I'm, I'm wondering if you could just so do you, do you now feel closer to these relatives that you've discovered through this process? Um, it's, the people that I'm dealing with really are my immediate family. So it's not that I didn't know them. It's that I didn't know their stories um, and didn't know my own story either until I was really in my 40s, 50s is when it all started to come back. And it really didn't hit until Steven Spielberg did Schindler's List. So up until that point, there was like no story that I could tell. And um, when, I, when I wanted to tell it, I didn't have a way to tell it. When I began after doing Glass for 10 years, I found a way to tell it. But 
what has interested me is, and you were talking about response of other people to telling a story rather than letting it go. You have to keep repeating these stories. And um, Peggy said the orbs, when she started making the orbs, they weren't, she didn't see them as creating a work of art. When I started with my first panel saying, thinking I have to memorialize my parents and my direct family for the things that they went through, um, I made the first panel, which was about my dad's life, without even thinking it would go beyond that. But it was when I created that that I realized I need to do this for each of them and, and create a legacy for them. And then in terms of, of Daggy talking to, about people's responses, that has been the most incredible thing to me because as I said, I've, I've given this presentation in so many different places and places where I'm not ever sure how they're going to respond to them. And so um, specific, the, the, the few specific ones is that I gave a talk by Skype and now we're doing it on Zoom. I gave a talk to a group of high school students in Australia, uh, in a very rural part of Australia. And most of the school were Aboriginal kids who had never studied the Holocaust, had never heard of the Holocaust. And there was this immediate connection that they made because they know about institutional racism. They know about families being broken up. Um, so I felt like this story touched them and, and hopefully made them understand they need to tell their stories. And that's what I was telling those kids. You need to tell your stories. And then another one, um, couple of different ones. I gave it um, in a, a retirement home, a Jewish retirement home in San Fernando Valley. And as I was talking about my mother's panel, there was a gasp from the audience because I had mentioned the city that the town that she grew up in. And there was a gasp from the audience and said, I grew up in that same town at the same time. And no one, I have never heard that city mentioned ever. So the fact that it touched her and her family was there that day and it touched them and made them realize too that she has a story to tell. She needs to tell that story. And then most recently I gave um, a talk to a group of people in London, Ontario, Canada, um, which is where I grew up and had kind of forgotten about, not forgotten about, I've been away for a very long time, didn't feel very connected with it. But when I was asked to tell my story there, what I realized is all of those people who were there that day were a part of my story as well, because that's the city that took my parents in when nobody else would. And so I've made these connections with people and hopefully what I've told them is we have stories to tell. We must continue to tell them. They will touch people and maybe we'll learn something from them. But I tell it because, because it makes me feel like I'm leaving a legacy for my family. I think that um, Fran, you touch on a, on an important point there for for all of the artists is the the importance of this work, um, the importance of um, creating something um, positive from um, from all of this pain, and to create um, a focus upon humanity and, and the uh, these shared experiences. Um, what well, I'm struck by which i hadn't considered until uh, really the, this last hour of, of talking was the, the the place that creativity has in um in all of this the, the creativity being that thing which has moved people from from numbness to sensitivity from being frozen to having movement and from um experiencing loss to to empathy and i think 
there's something very, um, very beautiful in what you've been talking about. Um, we, we don't have um, very many questions in the group chat, but there are some statements that have been made. And um, I think uh, if I just sort of uh, read some of those, um, I'll, I'll anonymize the individuals, but um, one person said that this exhibition has allowed me to refocus and to breathe again, which I think is a, a beautiful statement. Um, and another has said, um, you know, thank you for, for sharing um, so much of your intimate experiences. Um, I, I think people are, are connecting with you as makers, but as also as human beings. Um, and, and I think there is something as an organization and as, as artists within a creative community, I think there's something really quite powerful in, in what, we, what we're doing in this space. So I'd like to thank you all for, um, for being here, for, um, for sharing you know, your thoughts and for, um, and, and for giving us all the insight into the work that you've been doing um, these last few years. Um, as I say, really important work and uh, and very very moving work um so <laughs> i would normally ask our audience um for a round of applause or for some sort of recognition <laughs> i don't know if we want to go to the to the uh, to the gallery view and everybody can yeah. do the clappy hand thing that doesn't fit on the right side but does anybody on our panel have anything finally that they'd like to say well, i'd just like to say thank you to you peter for um for making this possible for us, because really at the beginning of the pandemic, it felt like there's no way that this can go on now. As, as we were saying before, it didn't seem appropriate. And then uh, coming up with a way to let us tell these stories was, was so creative. And, um, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Thank Me too. You. I want to say thank you to Peggy for the the idea. The, the idea. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Peggy. And, yeah. And I'm grateful to be included in it. And then, yeah, thank you, Peter, for all the hard work and um, all the social media posts that you've done about it to let people know that the, the exhibit is ongoing and you can come in in safe ways to view it. And so thank you very much. And it's also hung beautifully. Again, Peter, thank you. And Peggy, thank you so much for thinking of me. Oh, yeah. Peggy, thank you very much to think thank of Thank you. It. And I'm impressed by Dougie uh, to donate all the work. I'm impressed by Sandra's work. I, I sense your grief. I, I'm Asian, so I probably understand your work more. Um, I want to say to Peggy and Fran that all your work moves me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to this audience that, yeah, this is wonderful. And there's a friend out there that I haven't seen in almost 50 years. <laughs> Oh, this is I, this is wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Wow. Yeah, thanks to everybody who tuned in. <laughs> yeah. That's great. And thank you for um, thank you for coming to um, this Studio Channel Islands um, panel discussion. Um, we will have more um, online uh, programs as we progress through the summer, as um, I fear that it will be some time before we're able to have large gatherings in the gallery again but we are determined to continue to provide um, meaningful creative um, programs and to provide opportunities for our community to, to learn, share, and um, enjoy one another's creativity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.